Welcome to March. And uh, if you hadn't noticed yet, um, it's still not quite spring. If it was up to me, March 1st would be the start of spring, baby. All right? I'm all about 50s to low 70s kind of temperature. So spring and fall are like my best friends. Anybody with me on that one? Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, how many of you are more summer folks? It's like you got 75 or above, right? Okay. And how many of you are winter folks? And you got any like winter sports? Well, okay, we'll pray for you guys. Okay. <clears throat> But I would, I'd, love, I'd like to invite you guys, though, at this time, if you would please to open your Bibles, your Bible apps with me to Matthew chapter 3, uh, very first book in the New Testament. And we're also going to be getting to seven, chapter 17 in a few minutes. But uh, first, we need to focus here for a little bit. Over the past several weeks, we have been exploring some of God's many promises that he made to us in the pages of the Bible over the course of history. And last week, we touched on his greatest promise ever, and that is the promise of providing a way for us to come back to the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. And I think that this is an excellent bridge into the days ahead as we prepare our, our hearts and our minds and our spirits for the celebration of Jesus' resurrection on that special day that we call Easter. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to focus in on the person of Jesus, his ministry, his life, and again, his fulfilling of that greatest of God's promises. It's going to be all about Jesus, folks, just Jesus. And before we get to our main text this morning, I want to just pause and introduce our March Bible Memory Challenge that's, again, appropriately all about Jesus. It comes from John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, and it says that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Everything that John and the other gospel writers wrote was for this purpose, so that we might believe that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, we can have eternal life in his name. That's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus and, again, fulfilling that greatest of all his promises. So let's dig into Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to begin with a little backstory. Okay, so this is right before... Jesus launches his earthly ministry, and already there's another guy on the scene, John the Baptist. And chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says that in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And that's exactly what John did. He came to prepare the way for Jesus, to call people to repent and turn from their sins and show their repentance through baptism. So he stood there in the middle of the Jordan River with his camel's hair clothing and his leather belt wrapped around his waist, and he called out to anyone who would come and repent of their sins and be baptized as a sign of that. And you guys, this was new to the Jews, they weren't used to this kind of concept, and, and a lot of the Jews didn't like new, okay? especially the, the, the Pharisees, oh my goodness, Pharisees and the Sadducees, get those two mixed up. But you see, they used baptism to convert people from, from being Gentiles to Jews, and, and they figured that once they were baptized as Jews, they didn't need baptism anymore. They were now God's people, right? Nothing that they needed baptism for, especially for the removal of their sins. But then one day, Jesus stepped into the scene. The one person who really didn't need to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins steps onto the scene and walks straight up to John. And of course, John being the only person on the planet who was ever filled with God's Holy Spirit since even before birth, knew who Jesus was when Jesus approached him. He knew that Jesus was the Holy One, and he knew this was the one guy who doesn't need to be baptized for repentance sake. And so John tried to deter him in verses 14 and 15, saying, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus, and, and yet you're coming to me? And Jesus says, yes, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And that brings us up to the moment when Jesus earthly ministry begins. 
After this event, we have tons of information in the four Gospels about what Jesus' life and ministry and events look like. However, before this event, we really don't have a whole lot, do we? I mean, we know the birth story. We know there's a lot of action there with the, the wise men and the, and the shepherds and King Herod and stuff. And, and then the, 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 the flight to Egypt. And then there's like one other story before the baptism here. We, we see J- Jesus, you know, when he's 12 years old, there at the temple, hanging out for a few days while his parents are heading back home until they realize that, they're, that he's not with them, right? So, but not a whole lot else is, no, is there about Jesus' life. He's an unknown. And if he was known at all, it was as the carpenter or as Mary's son or as the brother of those four other guys, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. That's, that's all he'd been known for up until this point, up until this moment right here. And then it's as if God turns the spotlight of heaven directly on Jesus. And in verse 16, we read, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, Heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I want you to remember that line. We're going to come back to it. But first, I just want to read to you um, what William Barclay writes about this line right here in his daily study Bible series. He says this, The voice which Jesus heard at the baptism is of supreme importance. This is my beloved son, it said, with whom I am well pleased. That sentence is composed of two quotations. Okay, this is my beloved son is a quotation from Psalm 2-7. And every Jew accepted that psalm as a description of the Messiah, the mighty king of God who was to come. And with whom I am well pleased is a quotation from Isaiah 42-1, which is a, a description of the suffering servant a description which culminates in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 12. Barclay continues, he says, So in the baptism, there came to Jesus two certainties, the certainty that he was indeed the chosen one of God and the certainty that the way in front of him was the way of the cross. In that moment, he knew that he was chosen to be king, but he also knew that his throne must be a cross. In that moment, he knew he was destined to be a conqueror, but that his conquest must have as its only weapon the power of suffering love. In that moment, there was set before Jesus both his task and the only way of fulfilling it. Now, remember I told you to hang on to that one line. We see that same line, that same wording used in another place in the story that Carrie already mentioned to us this morning over in chapter 17. Fast forward over there in your Bibles. And Jesus, at this point, has walked through a few years of his ministry now. And he's beginning, at least mentally, to prepare himself for what's ahead as he knows he has to go to Jerusalem. He's not there yet. He's still got some time before he gets there. But, but he knows what's coming. And he knows that means his suffering and his death. And I'm sure if any of us knew the time or the place or or how we were going to die, it would be on our minds and it would be weighing on us as well, like it was for Jesus. So we come to Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, and it says, After six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And this account is also over in Luke and in Mark. And Luke's account adds this one little phrase to that line right there. It says, Jesus took them up to pray. These three men were Jesus' inner circle of disciples. And and I don't even know what all that means. I don't know if that means that they were his best friends or if that means that they were his best prayer warriors or the ones who were most kingdom-minded of the whole bunch. I'm not exactly sure, but this much I do know. These were the three guys that were called on for some of the special assignments in Jesus' ministry, okay? These are the three guys that Jesus called to go with him into the inner room of Jairus' house when he went in to raise his daughter from the dead. These are the three guys Jesus calls with him and goes up to the mountaintop, where we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. And these are the same three guys that Jesus calls with him to go deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was betrayed. Oh, here's a question for you. 
When do you tend to be the most serious and the most intense in your prayer time before the Lord? Isn't it in those times when we are struggling the most? And when do you call, when do you make that extra effort and call upon the prayer warriors in your life? Isn't it in those times when we're struggling the most? And that seems to have been the case here in Jesus' life, in his earthly life. Life. Yes, he was God incarnate, God in the flesh, God in human form, but, but that's just it. He was also in human form. You guys, he experienced all of the same kinds of things that we do. He felt that sharp rock when it went in his sandal and took a few steps, right? He felt the pain. And he also felt the burden of what was coming in Jerusalem, the cross that was coming up there, and that emotional drain weighed on him. So he called these three guys to go with him up to the mountaintop. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But the next verse says that there he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. The disciples caught a glimpse of his heavenly glory. In this moment, his, his face was shining like the sun. You guys, I was, I was driving west out of town the other day, right about sunset. Not a good time to be driving west out of town, okay? I mean, I, my, my visor didn't go down low enough, right? And, and you get like a half an inch between the visor and the road and your dash, and, and you're still getting blinded. And that's at sunset. I mean, we're talking Jesus was shining before them like the noonday sun, right? I mean, his glory is just blinding them. And in the middle of that incredible moment, something else incredible also happens. Next verse says, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And again, Luke's account adds that, that they spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. And the, the word that, that's used in the Greek, which we translate departure, is exodus which is the same word we use in English for exodus, right? So it's the departure from the, from the familiar to the unknown. And, and who better to talk with Jesus about that kind of a departure than Moses and Elijah, two of the heavy hitters from the Old Testament. Moses, of course, was the one who led the Israelites out of Egypt after 430 years of being there. Talk about familiarity. They knew Egypt, right? He's the one who brought them out of Egypt through the unfamiliar, that trek through the wilderness toward the promised land. He knew what an exodus was like. Elijah, the Jews thought, was probably the, the biggest of all of the prophets, right? Elijah left this world. He exited this world in a way none of us ever do, right? He didn't die the way most people do. Instead, he didn't even die. God just carried him up to heaven in a heavenly chariot carried by heavenly horses in a whirlwind of fire. So these two are the ones that are there talking with Jesus about his exodus, his departure from the familiar to the unknown through the way of the cross. These are the ones that were there to encourage him onward no matter what was coming next. The next verse in chapter 17 said that Peter said to, to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And if you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. All right, so let's, let's give Peter a little credit here, right? He recognized the fact that this was a special moment, unprecedented, in fact, right? Jesus has been transfigured right before their eyes, shining like the new day sun. Moses and Elijah then appeared out of nowhere, start talking to Jesus. And do you notice what you don't see in the text here? You don't see any introductions going on, right? It's like Jesus saying, hey guys, this is Moses and Elijah. Hey, Moses and Elijah, this is Peter, James, and John. It's like Peter, James, and John knew who they were, even though they hadn't been around for thousands of years. They just knew that this was Moses and Elijah. And on top of all of this that's going on, this is all happening where? On a mountaintop. You guys, this is the epitome of a mountaintop experience, right? And Peter, dear, wonderful Peter, he's so human, just like the rest of us. He wants it to last. Isn't that true for all of us? 
I mean, when life is really, really good, we want it to last. We just want to stay right there. When we are so close to God and we can just kind of feel his presence all around us, we just want to stay there in that moment as long as it'll last, don't we? Guys, that's what we are made for, to be in God's presence. That's why we like to linger there. That's why we want to stay as long as possible, because we just want to stay there. And Peter had never felt so close to God as he did in this moment. And rightly so. I never experienced anything like this before. And so he just wanted to hang out there as long as possible. But that's not what this time was about. And the truth is that's not what mountaintop experiences in our lives are generally about either. You see, there is going to come a day when those of us who are followers of Jesus are going to be able to bask in God's glory and in his presence forever and ever and ever. That day is coming. We're going to get to enjoy his goodness and his glory all around us. But today is not that day, at least not emotionally. And while we're here on earth, there are going to be some of those times where we're going to feel like they're too short. Some of those times when we get to be in his presence and it's almost like we can hear his voice. So close we can almost see his face. We can almost feel his physical presence. There are going to be some times like that. We're going to want to linger there. Guys, but there are also going to be those times we're traveling through this life when it's going to feel like he's a thousand miles away. Like our prayers are just empty sounds bouncing off the walls. But God uses both in our lives to create us to be more and more like his image. And for Peter and James and John, this mountaintop experience was extremely important, not even so much for this particular moment as it would be in the days ahead, okay, as it would be after Jesus had gone to the cross, after he had been resurrected, and after he had ascended back into heaven. When God called on his guys especially Peter, James, and John, to lead the church, this moment was going to become for them a reference point. This moment was going to be one of those confirmations in their life that, yes, I'm on the right path. I'm doing the right thing. Even though it stinks right now and it's extremely hard, I'm doing the right thing because they had this moment as a reference point. And you guys, it was the same for Jesus as well. One of those reference points that, yes, I am doing what God has called me to do. I am who God has called me to be, and I'm going where God has called me to go. It was confirmation, and it was a reference point for them. So Peter did what many of us would do, trying to figure out a human way that he could make that moment last as long as possible. And then while he's speaking, Scripture says, goes on to say, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay, so there were three distinct things they heard God speaking to them in that moment. First two are encapsulated in that verse that I told you to remember from Matthew chapter 3. First of all, God saying, this is my son whom I love. Confirmation. Like we saw back in Matthew 3, that Jesus is in fact the son of God, the Messiah God sent into the world to save humankind. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords forever and ever. Amen. The second thing God was saying was, with him, I am well pleased. Confirmation again, like we saw back in Matthew 3. Jesus had been doing and was continuing to do what God had called him to do. He was continuing to on the road to becoming the suffering servant, the perfect lamb of God, to be sacrificed for the sins of the whole world. And then the third thing that God said in that mountaintop moment was this. Listen to him. Listen to my son. Listen to Jesus. We all know the difference between hearing and listening, right? Right? I mean, if the technology is working right, And then all of you who are seeing my face right now and are seeing my lips are moving are also hearing what my voice is saying, right? But not all of you are necessarily listening at this moment. Hearing is a physical function, like seeing and like tasting 
And for many of us, hearing is one of those things that, well, it, it kind of declines as you get older, okay? On my way there. Uh, and, but here's the other thing. As humans, many, not all, but many of us have this really nasty habit of listening to the first words, first few words a person says, and then, you know, mentally shifting into neutral or going elsewhere, right? I mean, listening is very different from hearing. Listening, we have to mentally engage. But often again, we check out after a first, maybe even sentence, maybe not even a full sentence. Here's a few reasons why I think that might be. Number one, it may be because we think we know what the person is going to say, right? Number two, we don't care what the person is going to say <laughs> next, right? Or number three, we're just more interested in our own agenda, right? Now, the disciples had been following Jesus for over two years at this point, but they still didn't fully understand who he was and why he'd come. Check this out. If you flip back over a page to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19, we see what happens right before this mountaintop moment, okay? It says in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So it seems like they were getting it, right? I mean, at least Peter, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. He's got that part right. Woo, go Peter. And let's skip down a few verses to verse 21 there. Chapter 16, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and said, and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter still had that selective hearing that we often have going on. He was only hearing the things he wanted to hear coming out of Jesus' mouth. I mean, when it was a Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Son of God, Peter's right there. Go, yeah, let's do this. Woo, go. But when Jesus started talking about suffering and being killed, Peter said, no, 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 that's never going to happen to you. That Because that was not his vision of the Messiah. That was not his picture of how things were supposed to go down. So Jesus had some very stern words for him. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter was more interested in his own agenda than he was in the concerns of God. And maybe that's one of the reasons why God had to say here on the mountaintop, listen to him. Don't just keep on hearing the words of Jesus don't just keep on following him because it's the cool thing to do and you get to watch all these miracles. Don't just keep going to church or watching a service or, or re reading a couple of verses a day to check off a box on your human concerns list. Listen to him. Do you know what the next words were out of Jesus' mouth after he said these things to Peter? Chapter 16, some of the very powerful words God was no doubt referring to when he said, listen. Verse 24 says that Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Forever wants to lose, whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? 
For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Are you listening, church? Or are you just hearing the words of Jesus today? I, I fear that we are too much like Peter these days. I, we want the rewards that Jesus spoke about. We tune in very carefully to those parts. Those things that we like to hear sound so good, but we want to avoid phrases like deny ourselves, take up our cross. We want to we want to gloss over the things that say, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. We want that reward and we want it to keep everything else besides. We want to keep our comfort and our happiness and our, our health and our financial security, all of it. But that's following Jesus on our terms, not listening to what he actually said. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. In the middle of this mountaintop experience, God issues a wake-up call to the disciples and to us as well. We would do well to listen to the father and to his son to gain understanding of his complete message, the whole package, not just the parts that we like or are comfortable with. Next verse says that when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. God spoke into that moment there on the mountaintop. And I have to believe that it was in that moment that Peter and James and John were struck with the magnitude of what was really going on around them, with who they were standing before it was like for a moment the curtain had been pulled back. You know, the mask had been lifted and all of a sudden they are confronted with God's glory, the holiness of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And they are, recognize the fact that, man, we are filthy human beings. We can't stand in your presence, God. And they fell face down. And you guys, that's what it's going to be for everyone when they come into God's presence for that first time. No matter who they are, president or pauper, they are going to fall face down in his presence because of his greatness, his glory, his majesty, and his righteousness. That is the one right response when entering his presence. And I fear that, that we often try to water down his awesomeness so that we can more easily wrap our minds around it. But the truth is, his power, his majesty, his glory, so far beyond us, so far above us, there's nothing else that we can do but fall down before him. So Peter and James and, and John were face down on the ground, there on the mountaintop, just trembling before the Lord. Verse 7 says, but then Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Their eyes were back on Jesus. Only now their eyes were opened a little bit more. They understood a little bit more. And as the voice started to fade, as the glory of the light started to fade, Moses and Elijah are now gone. They started to see not just the everyday Jesus, that they had been walking with for the past few years, but they saw him also as the glorified Jesus, as the true son of God. And he was the one who was telling them to get up. Don't be afraid. Even knowing what was coming down the road. And he still tells us that same thing, you guys. He still tells us on those tough days, get up. Don't be afraid because he's with us. So what do, we, what do we do with all this mountaintop talk today? Well, I, I'm going to give you three takeaways. I'm going to go through them kind of quick here. The first one is this. That Jesus called the three disciples of his inner circle to go up the mountain with him. Who do you call to go with you up the mountain, so to speak, to pray? 
in those toughest times of your life? Who are your prayer warriors that you go to and tap on the shoulder and say, I need you with me on this one. This is a really tough spot, and I really need some of my best prayer warriors with me. Who do you call? The second part of that question is, who calls you? Who calls you as their prayer warrior? And if not, maybe it's time to do a little self-reflection. Say, why not? Why is anybody calling? Do, what can I do, God, to lift people up in prayer more, to lift up my family, my friends, my community, to be a better prayer warrior for you, to be one that somebody can rely on? Second takeaway is this. Jesus received counsel and encouragement from two of the heavy hitters of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, about his departure. Who do you look to for counsel and encouragement when you are facing the unknown? Uh, Moses and Elijah, that, that sets the bar pretty high. I mean, as far as counsel, you know, people are in your, in your corner, right? Um, who do you look to? I want to encourage you to find some people who are ahead of you in the faith walk. All right, who are more mature, who have been there longer or know, you know, have been through more than you have and look to them, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, could you please share your wisdom and insight with me, what you've learned, what God has shown you. Look for those people in your life that are beyond you and ask them for both counsel and encouragement. And finally, number three, on the mountaintop, Jesus was transformed or transfigured, however you want to say it, before his disciples. And these same disciples were transformed as a result of their relationship, of their time from being with Jesus. They went from being fishermen and businessmen to apostles and preachers and missionaries and even martyrs. How about you? Have you experienced a transformation in your life from being with Jesus? Can the people in your life see a difference in you because of the time you've spent with him? You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. And my prayer for each of us is that God will so transform our lives from our time spent with him that people, when they look at us, will not be able to deny that we are new creations because his glory is shining through us. Let me pray with you as we head out today. God, thank you so much for this time that we could share together today. God, we're not physically on a mountain, on a mountain top, but God, we, we enjoy those times with you, those moments when we get to be close to you and close with other brothers and sisters in Christ as we are, are, are standing before you, God. And we, we, live, we love those times to last and to linger. God, I pray that, that you would use those times in our lives like you did for Jesus and for the three disciples. God, you'd use those times as reference points for us. Times that we can look back to and we can share in our story to others as we're telling them, all that you've done for us. God, we know that you use those times to shape us just like you use the low times as well. God, I pray that, that you would help us as, our, as a result of our time with you to be transformed into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we want to look like. That's who we're going for. Help us to, to continue forward no matter what life brings so we can be more like you, God. And all God's people said, amen. amen.